Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Luque and I am the Associate Director for Life Science at the Electron Microscopy Unit of the Mark Rainwright Analytical Center at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. Today I will share in you insights into the cryo-electron microscopy characterization of viral particles. This advanced technique allows us to gain detailed understanding of viral particles at near atomic resolution, which is crucial for virology research. When it comes to biomedical imaging techniques, its methods offer a different resolution power ranging from more macroscopic to atomic level detail. At one end of the spectrum we have techniques like positron emission tomography or PET, which provides functional imaging at a resolution of millimeters. At the higher end of the resolution spectrum, X-ray crystallography enables us to see a structure at the atomic level, providing an incredible detailed view of biomolecules. Microscopy techniques such as optical microscopy and electron microscopy brings the gap between cellular and molecular scales. To truly appreciate the power of microscopy, let's compare the resolution capabilities of the human eye the optical microscope and the electron microscope. The human eye can resolve objects down to about 0.2 mm, which is roughly the width of a human ear. Optical microscope allow us to see a structure as small as 200 nanometer, such an individual set and some larger organelles. However, electron microscope offer a resolution down to less than 1 nanometer, enabling us to see fine detail is similar to what's a tennis match in the moon from the Earth. This is related to the illumination shoots. In optical microscopy, we are using visible light which has a wavelength of 200 nanometer, while the wavelength of electrons in vacuum is much more smaller. It was crucial at the beginning of the past century the discover that the electron can be accelerated in vacuum. In 1931, Ernest Ruska demonstrated that a magnetic coil could act as an electron lens and used several of these coils in a series to build the first electron microscope in 1933. Ruska's brother, Helmut, was a medical doctor and he developed the use of the electron microscope for medical and biological application, being the first scientist to study submicroscopic structures of bacteriophages and other viruses with an electron microscope. That the electron microscope has been a tool for the study of viruses from the very beginning. Although the aspect of the electron microscope has changed a lot during the years since its development in 1931 to the current cryo-electron microscope, the basic elements are the same. A number of electron lenses that are going to act as condenser lens, objective lens, and project. To better understand the transmission electron microscope, we are going to compare it with the transmission light microscope. The light microscope has photons, light, as illumination sure, and typically for the UV visible range, it has an associated wavelength between 200 and 700 nanometers. In the case of electrons, the wavelength is associated to the acceleration voltage of those electrons that in a transmission electron microscope typically range between 300 kilovolts and 1 kilovolt that has an associated wavelength between 2 picometers and 40 picometers, being a picometer 10 to the minus 12 meters, that is 100 less than an Armstrong, that is going to determine the resolving power of both instruments, being 200 nanometers for the light microscope, maybe 20 to 50 nanometers in resolution, super resolution mode, why the electron microscope can easily have less than half an Armstrong. That is also going to determine 
the magnification working ranges for light microscope and electron microscope. Typically, for light microscope, we have magnification ranges up to 1 to 1,000 times, while for electron microscope, the range can go up to several millions of times. However, not everything is advantages because while the light microscope can be operated at atmospheric pressure, the electron microscope need to be operated at high vacuum because air molecules scatter the electrons. Additionally, although the light microscope has some photosynthesis, is much less injurious than the electronic damage that electrons produce in samples. Just to give you an idea about that, this damage, being in the column of an electron microscope for a biological sample means the same level of energy that being less than five meters away of the point of explosion of a 50 tons nuclear bombs. That is a lot of energy. Finally, all these facts are going also to determine that while in the light microscope we can observe fixed or unfixed samples, that mean living or non-living samples, in the case of electron uh, microscope we need to fix our sample either chemically or physically. Additionally, the penetration power of the light microscope is much higher than the electron microscope one, which this penetration is limited to less than one micron in thickness. How are these problems of the transmission electron microscope solve? Basically, these problems are faced by a good sample preparation. Transmission electron microscopy allow us to observe and analyze both the cellular surface and the intracellular environment in cells and tissues, and also analyze macromolecular assemblies in solution. We can also combine this information with the localization of specific components by immunolocalization techniques. However, as I mentioned, the penetration power of the instrument is limited broadly to one microns. In most of the cases, much less. That is far above the size and the thickness of cells. That means if we need to analyze cells and tissues, we need to generate celsium, which is typically known as ultra thin section. However, macromolecular assembly typically range in the nanometric scale that is within the resolution, uh, sorry, the penetration power of the technique. That means that for viral capsids and viral particles, we are within that range and we can consider them as macromolecular assemblies to analyze. Here we have the analysis of bacteriophage T4 by different EM techniques, ranging from negative staining in A, B and F are ultra-thin sections with different levels of thun. C is metal shadowing. D is a simulation of how bacteriophage T4 will look like in a scan electron microscopy. And E is cryo-electron microscopy. The more typical techniques for analysis of macromolecular complexes by transmission electron microscopy copy is negative staining, metal shadowing, and cryo-EM. Negative staining and cryo-EM are the one typically used for viral capsids, while metal shadowing is typically only used for the analysis of nucleic acids. In the case of negative stain, it's a very versatile technique when we are going to embed our sample in a heavy metal solution to generate a negative of our sample. That is, we are going to see the heavy metal embedding our sample. Also, this technique is 
intrinsically artifactual because we are not seeing directly the sample, we are seeing uh, a negative of the samples, we are dehydrating the, the sample and we are attaching the sample to a surface which could deformate the structure is very useful because it's fast and it's cheap and give us a lot of information about the structure in different rates thus using exactly the same staining we can stain the whole particle for example this human respiratory syncytial virus particle and their components like this fusion protein from exactly the same particle. So using the same staining, we can analyze particles that range between 200 and 300 nanometers and their spikes that are only 10 nanometers in length. Using the techniques, many, many different viruses has been analyzed and most of the viruses has been described. Actually, it can also be used for rapid viral diagnosis by negative staining. However, how I mentioned, it is intrinsically artifactual because we are only seeing a negative of our sample and we are dehydrating it, what means that we are in conditions far away from the native state. For that, some years ago, Dubochet developed the cryo-EM technique. That is, instead of using a heavy metal to fix and preserve the sample, we are going to use temperature as cryoprotective and fixative. However, when we freeze water, usually we obtain crystalline ice. That means the water molecules are organized in a crystalline array. But this happens when the freezing is not fast enough. If we freeze slow our sample, we obtain cubic ice. If we increase that speed, we obtain hexagonal ice. But if we freeze our samples as at a ratio of thousands of degrees per second, we are going to obtain amorphous size. That is, an organization of the water molecules without any crystalline array. To obtain that ultra freeze freezing usually we use splash freezing that means that we are going to apply several microliters of the purified protein onto the grid then we are going to blot the excess liquid from the grid thus as we are using a carbon layer full of holes the sample is going to generate a really thin layer of water within that holes finally we are going to plunge the grid into liquid ethane that has a really good caloric capacity freezing our sample at the proper ratio to obtain a layer of vitreous ice. Here we have an image of the typical cryo-EM grid. We have a support that basically is an EM grid with a mess of squares that usually range between 300 and 400 nanometers for single particle analysis and this grid is made of gold or a mixture of copper and rhodium. On top of that grid we have a layer of carbon or gold with an array of holes of known size. These holes are going to be filled with our solution and after vitrification that solution is going to be a thin layer of vitreous size between 10 and 100 nanometers. In a solution of macromolecules we have a random distribution of macromolecules when they are applied to the EM carbon holy grid and vitrify we are going to obtain a thin layer of vitrifies where the molecules are randomly distributed. When these grids are imaged in the transmission electron microscope, we are going to obtain different views of the different molecules that we are going to assume that corresponds to different views of the same three-dimensional object. Then we can determine the orientation of these projections to obtain a three-dimensional model. 
when thousands of images are recorded, millions of particles can be obtained that are going to render a high resolution three dimensional maps that can be used to be interpreted in terms of individual residues, allowing us to build a whole three dimensional atomic model of the specimen that is being studied. If we now analyze the process, we have our solution, we apply it to the yin and grid, and once vitrify, we transfer it to the electron microscope when we are going to record thousands of micrographs. From these micrographs, we are going to extract the individual particles corresponded to each individual macromolecule. These different particles have different orientations. Then we are going to enter in an iterative uh, procedure named iterative projection matching when we have a three-dimensional structure that is going to be projected in all the possible direction of the space and our experimental images are going to be compared with these theoretical projections. Then we are going to assign the origin and the angles to experimental images and with these origin and angles we are going to obtain a new three-dimensional structure that is going to be projecting finer and finer angles in a process that is iterative and is formally named refinement. We are going to continue iterating this process until we obtain the best possible result. This single particle analysis approach has been used to determine the structure of a number of icosahedral analytical viruses. Here you have a gallery of viruses of different size from the porcin circovirus, one of the smallest icosahedral viruses described to the giant minivirus. In all the cases, the scale bar corresponds to 50 nanometers. During the past year, CryoEM has suffered a resolution revolution that has been reflected in an exponential growth of the use of this technique in structural biology. Actually, in 2017, the Nobel Prize was awarded to this technique. And this is partially related with a technical resolution revolution that has allowed to move from a situation in the early 2000s when basically three-fourths of the maps has 10 Armstrong resolution or less, that means you cannot even distinguish secondary structural element to nowadays, what is exactly the opposite, between two-thirds and three-fourths of the map has less than four Armstrong resolution. That means that at least a C-alpha model can be built from then, and in most cases, the whole structure of the macromolecular complex can be built. This is an example of how the technique has been evolving during these past 20 years. So at the beginning of 2000, we have a resolution ranging between 20 and 30 Armstrong for penicillium chrysogenum virus. This resolution basically allows us to distinguish subunits. In 2010, we were able to resolve the structure of some nanometric resolution. That means that we are able to distinguish secondary structure elements, basically alpha helices and beta sheets. Four years later, we determined the structure of 4.1 Armstrong resolution. That means that we can distinguish bulky atoms that allow us to trace the C-alpha structure of the molecule, but we can localize all the lateral chains. A couple of years ago, with 
much less effort and new and modern instrument and techniques we resolve the same structure of two point Armstrong resolution and this resolution is possible to distinguish every single side chain of the structure thus allowing us to build a full model of the virus this is especially related with new image recording system. Historically, images were recorded in micrograph or imaging plates that are not longer used. And now in the digital era, we use CCD cameras and DIDER detector. 10 years ago, was discovered the so-called pin-induced motion. That is, when the electron beam illuminates the sample, the carbon support film deforms such that the size of the hole shrinks by a small amount. At the same time, radiolysis of the solvent and macromolecules produce radicals that increase the pressure inside the, the ice layer. Both changes cause a drum motion of the ice layer that lead to particle rotation and translation. The direction of this drum is motion and it belongs to each individual particle. That means that if we record a single image, we are going to be recording a blurred image where particles are moving. In the case of CCDs, we don't have a detector able to detect directly the electron because CCD is a charge coupled device that is only able to detect photons. That means that we need an oscillator that transforms the signal from electrons to photons and fiber optics that connects that oscillator to the CCD. That is going to reduce the efficiency of our detector and is going to increase the point spin function, only allowing us to take single images of the of the sample during the last year a CMOS direct detector device has been developed these devices allow to direct detect electron having much smaller point spin functions and much higher quantum efficiency this efficiency is so much that using exactly the same dose we can take several images of the sample in a short time. That is, we can take a movie. This movie is going to allow us to correct this being induced motion and other motions of the sample. That is, recent technological advances, including this direct electron detector, but also computer programs to realign the frames and powerful classification methods has generated this resolution revolution that has moved totally the structural biology and the structural virology field. It is also very important the new automatic data collection software and the new microscope able to do such automatic data collection in an automatic mode for hours and even days. Basically, these programs allow us to map the whole reads, select each individual square, in each individual square, select individual holes and inside each hole, select several regions of interest that are going to be acquired and focused in an automatic way. This pattern allows to take thousands of movies without manual intervention. A typical modern single particle analysis workflow include frame collection, align those frames, determine the CTF parameters of the images, extract and normalize that particles, a first step of 2D classification, typically with several iterations, a second step of three-dimensional classification to classify bad particles, but also 
compositional and conformational heterogeneity and after this refinement we determine the resolution, correct the defects of the CTF and model building and model refinement is performed. This has allowed to obtain atomic resolution from some cases. At the moment, apoferritin is the gold standard of the technique and the best resolution has been obtained around 1.2 Armstrong resolution with real atomic resolution. In the case of viruses, there are several examples like AAV, polyvirus and enterovirus where two Armstrong or less resolution has been obtained. But typically for icosahedral viruses resolution between two and three Armstrongs are systematically obtained for different groups around the world. Other importance of the development has been the development of programs able to generate asymmetric reconstruction of prolate or icosahedral viruses with non-icosahedral parts, that is by symmetric expansion, symmetry relaxation, or localized reconstruction, it is possible to reconstruct the structure of tail bacteriophage, also the structure of the nucleotides inside the capsid, not following the icosahedral symmetry of the capsid, or resolve some non-icosahedral elements in the capsid, as for example, portal proteins in pentameric position of some capsids. However, as I mentioned previously, single particle analysis assume that the particles are similar between them. And thus, when you have a solution of particles in several orientations, you can assume that this several orientation corresponds to different orientation of the same three-dimensional object. However, this is not true for all viruses, and especially for pleomorphic viruses. And there is a second technique that allows us to reconstruct the, the structure of these viruses without this assumption, that is, the electron tomography, also named cryo-electron tomography, when it's done at cryogenic temperatures. In cryo-electron tomography, instead of take thousands of images of different areas of the grids, we are going to have a beautified grid and we are going to take different images of the same region of interest at different angles, what we call a tilt series. Then we are going to retroproject these images of the tilt series to obtain a three-dimensional map that is named Tomoram. This technique has been successfully used to determine the structure of a good number of different envelope and pleomorphic viruses like human cytomegalovirus, Lassa virus, severe acute respiratory syndrome and coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, Punjabera virus, rose sarcoma virus, Tula virus, murine leukemia virus, influenza, HIV, or the alorqueal virus is one. However, when we want to resolve a structure or viral structure inside of the cell, is not enough with transmission electron microscope because we need to obtain thin layer, thin sections of our sample. This can be done classically embedding the sample in different resins and doing ultra thin sections from them. However, embed the sample is going to introduce a number of artifacts that are going to hamper the native observation of the specimen within the cell. During the last years, a new technique has been developed to mill thin lamella in cryogenic conditions that maintain the structure 
of the components inside the cell. Thus, this is the combination of cryofocus ion beam scanning electron microscope and cryo AT. Once vitrify ourselves, ourselves of interest, they are going to be introduced inside a cryo scanning electron microscope that has a cross beam with a gallium of other plasma source. Then we are going to use this focus ion beam to define two regions that are going to be milled and are going to generate a thin lamella sustained by the cell itself. This thin lamella typically is between 100 and 300 nanometer in thickness. Thus, maintaining the cryogenic condition, this thin lamella can be stabilize and transfer to a transmission electron microscope, to a cryogenic transmission electron microscope. One transfer to the transmission electron microscope, cryo electron tomography is going to be performed by quite a tilt series of this thin lamella, reconstructing a tomogram of the structures within the cell, allowing us to have a vision, a capture of the native structure of macromolecules, including viruses within the cell. Thus, if we want to summarize both techniques in cryogen and single particle analysis, we are going to acquire images from literally thousands of regions region containing hundreds of particles and we are going to assume that all these particles correspond to different views of a same object. That, then we are going to extract the images from these particles for every single movie and we are going to determine the orientation of these particles to reconstruct this three-dimensional object. Thus, single particle analysis assume that the particles in solution are more or less homogeneous. In the case of cryo -ET, we don't have this assumption and we are going to take a tilt series of our samples where we are going to project our sample the same region in different directions. It has a limitations because we can only tilt the states at 13 degrees, typically minus 60, minus 70 to plus 60 to plus 70, generating a missing weight of information. With our tilt series, we are going to generate a three-dimensional tomogram where we have three-dimensional volumes of our particles. Then it's possible to extract individual areas of these tomograms in a technique that is named subtomogram averaging. Mm. This subtomogram averaging has been extensively used to determine the structure, for example, of proteins in the envelope of different envelope viruses. For example, we have the case of the human cytomegalovirus CB protein in post-fusion and pre-fusion conformation. Also, the Tula virus GNC DC protein or the Morion leukemia envelope protein. To conclude, I would like to highlight how cryoEM and cryoET can be complementary. While cryo-EM and single particle analysis provides high resolution structural detail, cryo-ET allows us to place this structure in their biological context. To gain a comprehensive understanding of the structural changes of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein during viral entry, this technique were combined. Thus, cryo-EM allow it to study the spike protein in its pre-fusion and post-fusion states when isolated in solution, providing high-resolution details of the individual spike conformations. In contrast, 
cryoity offered the unique ability to observe the spike protein in its native context of the surface of intact SARS-CoV-2 virions, allowing to locate this high-resolution information from a SPA in the surface of the viral membrane. By combining cryo-EM and cryo-ET, we can capture a more complete picture of the spike protein conformational transition, setting light on the molecular mechanisms driving entry and fusion.